So this is looking at biopsychology for your year two examination. Now remember your year one biopsychology content is in another video along with the year one approaches. This is looking at the year two stuff that we learnt after you came back from study leave. So what do you need to know? We're going to go back and have a look at fight or flight because it could now potentially be a 16 marker so we'll look at some of the evaluation points that you could have with that. The localization of function in the brain, uh, lateralization and split brain research, plasticity and functional recovery, the ways in which we can study the brain and biological rhythms and the effects of endogenous pacemakers and exogenous zeitgeibers. The fight or flight response. If we encounter a stressful or dangerous situation, the hypothalamus will be alerted. This will activate the sympathetic nervous system, which causes our adrenal medulla to re release adrenaline and noradrenaline. Adrenaline will cause a number of physiological changes and physiological arousal within our body. So remember, we are trying to either outrun, so flee, what is ever dangerous or stressful or fight it head on. Therefore, we're gonna have increased heart rate and breathing to try and increase the amount of oxygen flowing to our muscles. Our pupils will get bigger so they'll dilate to increase the amount that we can see to let more light in to make us more aware of what is going on around us. However, you'll see that digestion and saliva will decrease. So we we'll inhibit digestion and a decrease production of saliva. This is to prevent a waste of energy and resources going to things that aren't necessary. We want to spend all our energy either fighting or running away. After a while the parasympathetic nervous system will return our body back to normal. So you'll see a decrease in our heart rate, the breathing rate will return back to normal, uh, digestion will start again. So evaluation of this. This could now come up as a 16 marker. Remember you only need about three to four evaluation points. So Gray suggests that fight or flight isn't the only response that humans will encounter in a stressful situation. He actually suggests that the first response sometimes is a freeze response, so to avoid confrontation altogether. Also, it's been argued that females don't adopt a fight or flight response. Instead, they have a tend and befriend response. So Taylor said that women are more likely to protect their offspring and form alliances with other women. Also, because most of the research is conducted on males, it is beta bias to apply and generalise the findings to females because they're is minimising the biological differences between the genders. Also, it suggested that fight or flight isn't actually suited to modern day life, so it's quite maladaptive to in have this response because we rarely encounter things that require such an intense response. And generally, modern day stresses can actively, repeatedly cause the fight or threat response which can have a negative um, consequence on our health. So increasing blood pressure which can lead to coronary heart disease. Localization of function in the brain and hemispheric lateralization. So don't worry about these words. Localization just means that different areas of our brain are responsible for different behaviors, processes or activities. So certain functions will be located in certain areas of our brain. So certain parts of our brain will be in charge of causing certain behaviours or responses and processes. So for example, the motor cortex. So that's located in our frontal lobe and it sends a nerve impulse to the muscles and it controls different parts of the body. The right hemisphere controls muscles on our left side and vice versa. So the left hemisphere controls muscles on our right side. So the motor cortex deals with our movement and is located in the frontal lobe. The somatosensory cortex is located in our proprietal lobe. It processes sensory information from our skin 
So it produces our sensations such as touch, pressure, pain and temperature. And once again, the left hemisphere deals with the right side of our body. The right hemisphere deals with our left side of our body. The visual centre is located in our occipital lobe. And our nerve impulse is formed. The retina is transmitted to the optic nerve, to the thalamus and it relays it to the visual cortex. So again, remember, left visual field is processed by the right hemisphere, right visual field is processed by the left hemisphere. Auditory centre is located in the temporal lobes, and this is to do with sounds, and it's how sound is interpreted and decoded. So you need to be aware of those four centres. So the motor cortex, somatosensory, auditory and visual centre. You might be asked specifically about them. You might have a diagram where you have to uh, locate them in the different parts of the brain. So please be aware of where they are located. Language centres. So language centres are just located in our left hemisphere. Okay. Unlike the motor cortex, which is in both hemispheres, language is just on the left. Broca is located at the posterior parts, so that's the bit at the back, posterior means behind, of the left frontal lobe. So it's just located at the back bit of the frontal lobe. And it's to do with speech production. So damage to Broca's area causes broker aphasia and that is characterized by a speech that is slow or lacks fluency. So people with broker's aphasia might also find difficulty in finding the words for certain objects. So broker actually studied a patient called Tan and he called him Tan because that was all he could say. Wernicke's area is located at the posterior of the left temporal lobe. So the back bit of our left temporal lobe and it's to do with speech comprehensions. So patients that have damage to Wernicke's area can produce language, but they don't necessarily understand it. So they can produce fluent language, but it could be meaningless. They also tend to produce nonsense words, so neologisms. So we have supporting evidence, Broca's aphasia is an impaired ability to produce language and in most cases is caused by brain damage to Broca's area. Wernicke's aphasia is impairment to language perception and is demonstrated by the important role played by this brain region in comprehension of languages. There's also been a number of brain scans to demonstrate how Wernicke's area was active during listening tasks and Broca's areas was active during reading tasks. Okay. So we could talk about how that is particularly scientific, the use of brain scan scans very scientific. So that would be another strength to extend that evaluation point a bit further. However, Dronkers examined the preserved brains of two of Broca's patients using MRI scans. And it was found that other areas were damaged, not just Broca's area itself. So it suggests that Broca's area isn't solely responsible to broker's aphasia and generally lesions that affect broker's area only result in a uh, temporary speech disruption not a permanent one it's biologically reductionist to reduce the very complex human behaviors and cognitive processes to one specific brain re region so critics suggest that a more thorough understanding of the brain is required to truly understand the complex cognitive processes like language also, Lashley removed areas of the cortex, so between 10% and 50% of this cortex was removed in rats when they were learning a maze. And they found that no area was more important than others in their ability to learn a maze. So it suggests that our function isn't localised as the theory suggests. Lateralisation. So lateralisation is the idea that we have two halves, the brain is divided into two hemispheres, and they are different 
to one another and that certain mental processes and behaviours are mainly controlled by one hemisphere or the other. So think back to what we just talked about. Language is in the left hemisphere. Left hemisphere dominant for language and speech, whereas right hemisphere specialises in visual and motor skills. So left brain tends to be log analytical, logic, language, science and maths, whereas the right brain tends to be more intuition, creative, art and music. Now these two hemispheres are connected by the corpus callosum, which carry information from one hemisphere to the other. So it's a little bundle of nerves that allows information from the left hemisphere to reach the right hemisphere and vice versa. The connection via this bundle of nerves means that we are still able to talk about things we perceive by the right hemisphere. However, split brain research and split brain patients. So to treat severe epilepsies, some patients had the corpus callosum cut. So therefore, they have no way of communication between the two hemispheres. The corpus callosum isn't able to pass information from the right hemisphere to the left hemisphere and the left hemisphere to the right hemisphere. So Sperry was interested in this. So he had patients that had this split brain. They had the corpus callosum cut. And they were presented with information either in their left visual field or their right visual field. And they had to respond verbally in what they had seen or they had to use one of their hands to pick out what they had seen. So it's found that if they were shown an image in their right visual field, the patient could say what they had seen. However, if it was shown in their left visual field, they would say that there was nothing there. So think back to our hemispheres. We said that the right visual field is processed by the left hemisphere. And as our left hemisphere contains our language centers, they were able to say and produce what they had seen. If they were shown it in the left visual field, it's processed by the right hemisphere. So there's no language centers in the right hemisphere. So they, and they, they didn't have the corpus callosum to send the information across to the language centers. So there's no way that they could produce the speech to say what they had seen. So that's why they said there was nothing there. However, if they were shown an object in their left visual field, they wouldn't be able to say what they'd seen, but if they were asked to pick an image or select an object with their left hand, they would be able to do so because the motor cortex in the right hemisphere is controlling the left hand, the left side of the body. So remember the left visual field goes to the occipital lobe in the right hemisphere is processed. The right hemisphere is processing that information via the motor cortex, sending information to the left half of the body, to the left hand, and they could select the image. So this allowed them to conclude there are differences between the two hemispheres. The left is responsible for speech and language, and the right specialises in spatial awareness and facial recognition. So let's evaluate this. The experiments involved highly specialized and standardized procedures. So that increases the internal validity because we can control any extraneous variables that could confound the results. However, it also increases the reliability. Because the re procedures are so standardized, it means that it could be replicated, which increases the reliability. Also, there are advantages to lateralization. So Rogers found that in domestic chickens, lateralization was associated with the enhanced ability to perform two tasks at the same time. So it's beneficial to have two hemispheres dominant in different things because they could find food, but be vigilant for predators as well. We could extend that evaluation point with a counter argument 
So talk about the difficulty in extrapolation. So applying the findings from animal research to humans. Okay. Humans have higher order thinking. They have far more complex behavior. Therefore, we should be cautious when generalizing the findings. Never say we can't generalize. Say we need to be cautious when applying or generalizing the findings. Again, we have difficulty generalizing because the studies only had a few patients. So these patients may have had underlying physical disorders to begin with, or they may have had some intact nerve fibers remaining. This is the di difficulty using clinical populations and comparing it and generalizing the findings to non-clinical populations. We don't know that there was an underlying disorder before the surgery. We've also got some contradictory evidence. So language was not necessarily restricted to the left hemisphere. So right-handed people generally develop their language centers in the left hemispheres, but left-handed people may have them on either side or both sides. Also, it is possible for split brain patients to develop new abilities. So JW developed the capacity to speak about information that was presented in either hemisphere. So that weakens the assumption that the left is dominant for language and the right is dominant for facial recognition and spatial awareness. It's possible that both hemispheres can take on that role. Plasticity and functional recovery. So plasticity, so the brain continues to create new neural pathways and alter existing ones. So it's like plastic, it can mold, be malleable. The brain can develop new connections between frequently used ones. They become strengthened and some neural pathways will get deleted. So that's called synaptic pruning. We will get rid of ones that we don't use. So some examples that we could talk about to enhance our knowledge. So playing video games uh, results in new synaptic connections in the brain area involved in spatial recognition, strategic planning, working memory and motor performance. There tends to be a gradual decline in cognitive function with age, but even 60 year olds still have brain plasticity and can increase their brain matter in the visual cortex when taught new skills such as juggling. So when they were taught how to juggle, they increased the grey matter that they had. Also, it was found that Tibetan monks produced more gamma brain waves than students who were asked to meditate. So indicating that meditation can cause permanent changes. So they'd strengthened those neural pathways in the brain. Functional recovery, so that is when we transfer the functions from a damaged area of the brain to an area that is undamaged. So it can happen by neural unmasking. So its dominant synapses can be reactivated when they receive more neural input than before. So basically, if we have one area of a brain that is damaged, other parts of our brains will, will take on that role of that part of the brain and develop skills to allow them to carry out the same process or functions. Stem cells can be implanted in the brain to help treat brain damage, so they can be directly replacing the damaged cells. They can be secreting growth factors that rescue the injured cells, or they can form a neural framework linking uninjured areas with the damaged brain region. So this is the the idea that other parts of the brain will, will develop this role. So it's found that rats that were kept in complex environments developed more new neurons than rats that were kept in cages. So it showed an increase in neurons in the hippocampus, which is associated with learning and navigation. So that's suggesting that there was plasticity in their brain. They developed and strengthened and added new neural pathways. Again, we can have that counter argument there about the extrapolation from applying from rats to humans. Rats and humans are very different in terms of their brain structure and um, complex behaviour. Maguire looked at taxi drivers and their grey matter 
and there's a positive correlation between the size of their hippocampus and how long they'd worked as a taxi driver. So it's suggesting that they have plasticity in their brain. The longer they'd spent driving as a taxi driver, the bigger their hippocampus would be and the more grey matter they had. Stem cells have helped rats with traumatic brain injury. So in, com in controlled uh, experiments, rats were given transplants of stem cells into the brain developed by more neuron-like cells in the area that was injured. So therefore, we can also link that to the economy. So if we're able to um, treat people with brain damage, help them recover from a stroke or injury and return back to work, they can make contributions to the economy. So we can talk about the benefits of psychological research within our society. However, our weaknesses, educational attainment could also be a factor. So it might not necessarily be down to brain injury. So they examined data from the US Traumatic Brain Injury Database and nearly 40% of the patients with a college level education achieved disability free recovery after a year compared to 10% who had left school early. So there's other factors that could influence our functional recovery. Also functional plasticity reduces with age. So adults need to be uh, develop compensatory behaviour strategies such as writing lists and seeking social support. So ways of studying the brain. It's important that you read the question carefully. If in the exam it says ways of scanning the brain, you can only talk about fMRIs, EEGs or ERPs. Do not mention post-mortems because that's not a scanning technique. If you see ways of studying the brain, you can mention post-mortems. However, under exam pressure and conditions, you might misread that word scanning and studying. So pay attention to when you're reading in the exam. So fMRIs measure the changes in blood flow, indicating that there's increased neural activity. So it's useful in identifying areas of the brain which are involved in certain processes and functions and behaviours. So a strength of it is it's non-invasive, so it can be done without causing any harm. And it's more objective than relying on verbal reports of what people think that they are doing and useful for studying non-verbal phenomena. However, it doesn't measure neural activity directly, so data can be misinterpreted and it overlooks the network nature of the brain as it only looks as localised activity. EEGs measure the electrical activity, so electrodes are placed on the scalp using the skull cap and they show the brain waves over time. They're often used to, uh, as a diagnostic tool for unusual arrhythmic patterns and neurological abnormalities such as um, Alzheimer's. So they record brain activity in real time so they can monitor the responses to a certain task and they're useful for clinical diagnosis. So epileptic seizures are characterised by spikes in the EEG. However, they can't detect activity in deeper brain regions such as the hippocampus and you can't pinpoint the exact source of activity. So electrodes detect the electrical activity, but they could be from overlapping areas. ERPs are a response to a specific event and it can be isolated through the statistical analysis of the EEG data. So sensory ERPs occur in the first 100 milliseconds after a stimulus, whereas cognitive ERPs are generated later. So they can measure brain responses without needing the behavioural response or speech, and they are continuous measures, so they produce quantitative data. They require many repetitions to gain meaningful data, which could be costly and they only record brain changes at superficial level of the brain. Post-mortems then, so researchers may study a person who displays behaviour while they are alive. When they die, they may examine the brain and look for abnormalities. Brain tissues can be examined in great detail and deeper structures can be investigated in comparison to scanning techniques. 
Changes in the neurotransmitters can be measured, so abnormal abnormalities associated with schizophrenia. However, the use of drugs, antipsychotic drugs, for example, uh, and age could affect the brain tissue, so there may be confounding variables. And it's only respective data, so it's too late to test the cognitive functioning. Circadian rhythms. So we need to know about biological rhythms. Circadian rhythms are biological rhythms that last for 24 hours. They adapt to the body to meet the demands of the day-night cycle. They are controlled by the suprachiasmatic nucleus. You can abbreviate it to SCN in the exam. I would try and write suprachiasmatic nucleus first, then in brackets write SCN and then refer to it as SCN throughout the essay or answer. Uh, the environmental light levels cause neural signals to be sent to the SCN, so it allows the circadian rhythms to be synchronised with daylight hours. Generally, our body follows a 24-hour pattern. So, for example, the strongest sleep drive is usually between 2 and 4 a.m. and 3, 1 and 3 p.m., and sleepiness is more intensive with sleep deprived. The free running internal clock uh, maintains a cycle of 24 to 25 hours, even in the absence of external cues such as light. However, it is disrupted by major changes such as jet travel or shift work. So Ashhoff and Weaver got participants to go in a World War II bunker for four weeks, so they're deprived of natural light and all but one of the participants displayed a sleep-wait cycle of 24 to 25 hours, so suggesting that it is consistent, even without those external cues. Our body cycle is around 24 hours. Also, our core body temperature is lower, at its lowest, at around 4.30 a.m., and it's at its highest around 6 p.m. It also dips between 2 and 4 p.m. Hormone production follows a circadian rhythm, so melatonin is produced by the pineal gland and peaks during the hours of darkness, which helps promote sleepiness. So we've got um, an explorer who spent six months in a cave with no daylight clocks or radio, and he found that his circadian rhythm settled just over 24 hours. So even again, without those external cues, sleep-wait cycle was 24 hours. There are important real-world applications. So timings can affect drug treatments. So to be most effective, drugs need to be released to a body at an optimal time. So the risk of having a heart attack is greatest in the early morning. So that's led to the development of drug delivery systems that release the drug into the bloodstream during that period of time. Therefore, demonstrating the importance of psychological research. However, there are individual differences in the circadian rhythm. So it's been found that the cycle length can vary from anywhere between 13 hours to 65 hours. So that doesn't, we can't apply universality to everyone. Temperature can be more important than light, so it seems that the SCN transforms information about light levels to set the body's temperature. So it's found that fluctuations in the body temperature causes tissues to become active or inactive. So where it could be that actually temperature is more important than light. Also, much of the research is criticised for being uh, low in external validity so it's often carried out in artificial conditions therefore the behavior could be argued to be similarly false and artificial it might not be applicable to everyday life infradian and ultranian rhythms so infradian lasts more than 24 hours so for example the female menstrual cycle is dictated by the endocrine system however not solely down to the release of hormones, light and odours, so our zeitgeibers, can also have an effect. 
So it was found that when women received an odourless compound from the armpits of the women in the later half of their menstrual cycle, their cycle was shortened due to the pheromones that they'd experienced. However, the other group that had the pheromones from another donor woman's armpits displayed and they were collected at the beginning of the cycle, so when the woman was at the start of her menstrual cycle, it lengthened the receiver's cycle. So suggesting that pheromones have an important impact on the infradian rhythm. All tranian rhythms last less than 24 hours, such as the sleep cycle. So the human sleep cycle alternates between REM and NREM and it has five stages. So the cycle starts at light sleep, goes to deep sleep and then into REM. And the brain waves speed up and dreaming occurs during REM stage. This repeats to about every 90 minute cycle. So a person can experience up to five complete cycles through their night time. So each human sleep cycle lasts 90 minutes and then you'll move into the next cycle. This 90 minute cycle isn't just dependent during sleep. So Kiltman argues that it continues during the day. So in the day we move from a state of alertness to physiological fatigue approximately every 90 minutes. So this is called the basic rest activity cycle and it suggests that human minds can only focus on something for about 90 minutes. At the end of that 90 minutes the body begins to run out of resources. And so evaluation. So menstrual synchrony, so the idea that women will sync with their menstrual cycles may have evolutionary value. So it may be evolutionary advantageous for women to menstruate together at the same time because it means that increases the likelihood that they would fall pregnant around the same time. Therefore, newborn babies could be cared for collectively as a social group, which increases the chances of survival. We've also got supporting evidence that rhythms can impact on behaviour. So around ovulation, so when women are most fertile, they tend to prefer more masculine faces and they represent good genes. So for a man to be masculine and be healthy suggests that he has a good immune system. A masculinized, masculinized face tends to be a result of high levels of testosterone. Testosterone can actually actually have an immunosuppressant effect so it can weaken the immune system. So for a man to look manly but be healthy would suggest that he has a very strong immune system which would also indicate that he has good genes that could be passed on to offspring. So women prefer these masculine faces and are more likely to seek them for a short-term partner. So they increase their chances of conception. So it suggests that our rhythms can impact on our behaviour. Also, Erickson found evidence for this uh, basic rest activity cycle. So elite violinists generally practice for 90 minutes at a time and then take a nap. So it supports the idea of a 90 minute alternating cycle of alertness and fatigue. However, there are individual differences in the sleep patterns and they might not be biologically determined. So Chucker found large differences between individual sleep patterns that were consistent over 11 nights in a controlled sleep lab. Also there are methodological limitations in synchronization studies. So it's been found that there are many factors that can affect the change of a woman's menstrual cycle including stress, changes in exercise and eating patterns which could be a confounding variable. So it weakens any support with the influence of zeitgeibers influencing a female menstrual cycle. 
endogenous pacemakers and exogenous site guibers. Endogenous pacemakers are the internal body clock in a brain that regulates the biological rhythm. So endogenous is internal. So the suprachiasmatic nucleus acts as our master clock and it controls other pacemakers in the body. It receives information about the light levels via optic nerve and it makes the, sure that our circadian rhythms are synchronized with daylight. Generally it sends information to the pineal gland which causes our hormone melatonin to be released at night to increase our sleepiness levels. Um, melatonin inhibits the brain's mechanisms that promote wakefulness so it induces sleep, it makes us feel sleepy. De Corsi removed the suprachiasmatic nucleus from 30 chipmunks and used controls with intact suprachiasmatic nucleus and then she released them back into their natural habitat and observed them. After the 80 days, most of the chipmunks that had had the nucleus removed had been killed and it was due to them remaining awake during times when they should be asleep. So it had affected their sleep-wake cycle. Therefore, it could be argued that the suprachiasmatic nucleus has an evolutionary advantage because it enhances survival. Ralph et al investigated the role of the suprachiasmatic nucleus in the sleep-wake cycle of hamsters. They removed the suprachiasmatic nucleus from a sample of mutant hamsters who had a natural sleep-wake cycle of 21 hours and they transplanted them into the brains of hamsters that had a natural sleep cycle of 24 hours. It was found that the hamsters that had originally had a sleep-wake cycle of 24 hours changed to a sleep-wake cycle of 21 hours after having that suprachiasmatic nucleus implanted, showing that the suprachiasmatic nucleus is a dominant endogenous pacemaker. Exogenous zeitgeibers are external factors, so environmental effects that can affect our biological clock. Light is one of them, so light resets our biological clock each day, keeping it in around about 24 hours. Specialised light detecting cells in the retina gauge the brightness and send signals to the suprachiasmatic nucleus to set our daily clock. It's found that even in blind people this system works, so even without the absence of the rods and cones and visual perceptions, these cells that are specialised in detecting lights will send signals to the suprachiasmatic nucleus. So Campbell and Murphy, 15 participants were woken at various times and had a light pad that was shone to the back of their knees. The researchers managed to produce a deviation in their sleep weight cycles of up to three hours. So it suggests that light is a powerful exogenous zeitgeber. Also, that we don't necessarily need to rely on the eyes to influence the brain. So remember the light was shone, shone on the backs of their knees. Social cues are another indicator of exogenous zeitgeibers. So people were also influenced by social cues from the activity of people around us. So infants around six weeks of age, their circadian rhythms begin. And by 16 weeks, most babies are trained and in a routine. So the schedules imposed by the parents are the key influences and adults determine the meal times and bedtimes. Research also suggests that by adapting to the local times of eating and sleeping when you travel rather than responding to the, your own feelings of hunger and fatigue is an effective way of training 
uh, our circadian rhythms and for beating jet lag when traveling long distances. So evaluation then. When volunteers were exposed to light treatments in order to shift their sleep weight cycles, the participants who had ex been exposed to bright light felt sleepy two hours earlier in the evening and woke two hours earlier in the morning, suggesting that light is a key external exogenous zeitgeber in influencing our sleep wake cycle. Also, a student who spent 25 hours, a, 25 days in a lab, sorry, without daylight, her core temperature rhythm stayed at 24 hours, but her sleep wake cycle extended to 30 hours. So much longer than the normal 24, 25 hour sleep wake cycle. So it suggests that daylight is an important exogenous zeitgeber in regulating these sleep patterns. De Corsi's and Ralph's study involves ethical issues. The animals were exposed to considerable harm and subsequent risks. Also, you know, if you look at the last evaluation point, using animals in research also raises concerns about extrapolations. Clearly, psychological differences between humans and rats and hamsters and chipmunks. Also, studies tend to lack ecological validity, uh, validity by isolating one pacemaker or one zeitgeber. It's rare that these would work in isolation in real life, so therefore we might not be able to apply it to real life settings. <laughs>